Well, I don't have much of a challenge left because uh, there's a saying that you'd never stand between an audience and it's lunch. <laughs> so I will do my best to compress, but I do want to point out I was a college teacher for a while, and I, you never go, never go far without books. There are lots of books about the Balkans. These are four of the best. I will leave them here. If you're interested, you may come up and browse. Um, a great American philosopher, Henry Ford, um, once said, and I'm quoting, history is bunk, unquote. Um, the fact is that when you talk about someone like Slobodan Milosevic, uh, you have to start in 1389. So I'm going to compress the period between 1389 and 2015 in 15 minutes. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. Uh, why 1389? Well, very quickly, uh, the Serbs in 1389 were defeated by the Turks at the Battle of Kosovopolia, which means Field of Crows. And every year... They celebrate a defeat, and they've been doing it since 1389. The Turks beat them. But there is an obsession in the Balkans with history. These are people, not just Serbs, but also Croats, Bosniaks, uh, Roma, Hungarians, everybody in the region who care more about the past than the future. And this makes a dialogue about the future very hard. And this is combined with a concept, which I also need to uh, put in at this point, the concept of the nation. Americans don't make a distinction between nation and state. Did you ever think of why the United Nations is called the United Nations? It's because the term United States was already taken. True. And that's important because we like to think of ourselves as a great mishmash of people from various areas with a hyphen hyphenated Americans. That doesn't work in the Balkans, as it doesn't work in parts of Latin America, all of Iraq, all of Afghanistan, and so on. My identity matters more than my passport, is the way they look at it. It's certainly the way Slobodan Milosevic looked at it. Um, Churchill once said, another rich field for quotations, the problem in the Balkans is that there is too much history per capita. Well, in the case of the modern Yugoslavia, you have to start with Marshal Tito, who died in 1980. Josip Broz Tito, who defeated the Nazis' 15 divisions and kept them from fighting in Russia, tied them down for the entire war. Not bad. He was president of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, the LCY, from 1939 to his death in 1980. There was vicious fighting in the Balkans. A lot of it was ethnic. It wasn't against the Germans. It was Serbs against Croats, Croats against Serbs, Muslims against Croats and Serbs, and so on. Now, I need to stress one thing. In 1996, when I was in Bosnia for the first time, um, I was uh, Richard Holbrook's special envoy for the Bosnian Federation. And we, uh, among other things that we did, the, I was working with the US Army, General Petraeus, we dug up a lot of mass graves. I need to tell you this before lunch, not after. Uh, we used a backhoe, so you can imagine the condition of the remains. We discovered something while we were trying to identify the ethnicity. Is it a Serb, is it a Croat, is it a Bosniak? They all had exactly the same DNA. It didn't matter if you were a Serb that means uh, Orthodox ch Church, a Bosniak, Muslim, or a Croat, Catholic. It was only an accident of what valley you happened to be born in that defined your identity. And this caused, oh, approximately a million deaths, no, 200,000 deaths and a million refugees. They talk about ancient hatreds, which is a ridiculous way of looking at it. These are modern hatreds, and they continued. Now, who was Slobodan Milosevic, and how did he play into this? The last person you would expect. He had the charisma of a brick. <laughs> he was a lawyer. He became a banker for the Bank of Yugoslavia with uh, time spent in both London and uh, New York, which is where he got his good English. 
Both his parents, interestingly, and this is perhaps significant, committed suicide. Um, he was a minor official in the League of Communists of, Yugo of uh, Serbia. Remember, Serbia was one of six constituent republics of Yugoslavia. Six. But it was the one that had the largest population. It's also the one that had this sense of the fact that because we lost to the Turks, Europe should be grateful to us. We, the Christians, protected Turk um, the Balkans and all of Europe against the Turks, forgetting that the Turks marched right on and at one point actually um, invested Vienna and Budapest. In April 1987, the head of the League of Communists of Belgrade, whose name was Stambulic, very nice guy, decided he didn't want to go to a rally that was going to take place in at the battlefield of Kosovo Polje. By the way, Kosovo was then, and now even more, 90% Albanians, so not Serbs, but it was part of Serbia. And so he said, Slobo, why don't you go? And he went. And there was a riot. All of the Serbs, and there were significant, significant numbers, came out and protested at what they saw as Albanian domination. Someone's always dom dominating somebody in the Balkans. And Milosevic got up, and I think he was surprised by his own eloquence. He said, no one should dare to beat you. And this went on television. And it was electric. And suddenly Milosevic went from the deputy to Stambulic to the lightning rod figure in late Yugoslavia. It was an eye opener for him. The road to power, he realized, did not lie in communism. Communism was a dying issue. It lay in Serb nationalism. And there were certainly, we know their names, Croats who concluded the same thing, a man named Franjo Tudjman, you may have heard, and Bosniaks, although the Bosniaks were the only ones who didn't have immediate neighbors to support them, Bosniaks being Muslims. Uh, so they were a little bit more modest about it. Anyway, Milosevic continued to accumulate power over the next couple of years, and in 1989, well, June 28th, 1989, just happened to be the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo Polje. By the way, it was also the 70th or 80th, my math is bad, uh, anniversary of the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, so it had a double whammy significance. And so Milosevic went back to the battlefield and gave a speech to one million Serbs. To his credit, our ambassador, uh, Warren Zimmerman, refused to go. And he said, quote, six centuries later, we are in battles and quarrels. They are not armed battles, though such things should not be excluded. Well, that was the signal. To telescope things further, now we finally get to the election. In 1990, Yugoslavia held its last election as a federation. It was a multi-party election. And Milosevic did not run as a communist. And he was democratically elected. By not a whole lot. It was 40% victory, but that was enough. Milosevic remained president of some kind of Yugoslavia because it kept losing parts until, well, for 10 years, until 1990, when he uh, overplayed his hand and lost to an election that he didn't even have to hold. He decided to call a snap election to anchor his power further. It didn't work. But what happened between 1980 and 1990? Well. First, the war between Serbia and Croatia, and then the war of Serbia and Croatia against Bosnia, and two million refugees out of a population in Bosnia of four million. 
and several hundred thousand dead. And all of this time, Milosevic very carefully kept his distance from the perpetrators, who were Radovan Karadzic, a name you've probably heard, and Ratko Miladic, his military commander. They were Bosnian Serbs. And it was only in 1994 when the sanctions that the United States placed on Serbia began, began to bite that he tried to rein in these two vicious war criminals and failed. And he finally cut them loose. And when the Dayton Accords were finally negotiated at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, in the fall of 1995, Milosevic was there, an autocrat, a war criminal, but the only one we would talk to. And he managed to survive until 1990, when he finally had his former friend Stambulic assassinated that he was arrested and taken to The Hague, where he died of a heart attack in 2006, having never been convicted. But if you are interested in reading about a man who never defined himself except in terms of everyone else being negative, you should read about Slobodan Milosevic. And I know that Dick can tell you stories that I've never experienced. I can tell you, though, I have two minutes. Uh, I can tell you that I remember Dick Holbrook coming to Sarajevo time and time again in 1995, 90, no, 96, 97, and shaking his head and saying about Milosevic, you know, I talked to the guy for three hours, and, and there's no there there. <laughs> Whatever there there was was inward turned defensive, passive aggressive might be the best term, and an autocrat, autocrat to the core because he didn't know who he was and he wasn't about to let anyone else try to define him. Thank you.